Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Dental Voice on the Case, a special edition of Dental Voice that we're going to be having here. The purpose of On the Case is to basically figure out and how to solve dental crime. So today, we're on the case with Dr. Jay Resnick, who's going to take us through the crime of stress in dentistry. Good morning, Dr. Jay. How are you? <laughs> Good morning, Ro. How are you doing? Very Good. well, thank you. Thanks Thanks for having me here. So if you would, please, we're really excited to, to understand. The case that we're trying to solve today is this issue of, of crime and how, oh, I'm sorry, this the crime we're trying to solve is this issue of stress mm -hmm. oh, and, and how this affects clinicians. So if you could, could you take yeah. us through and then also show us some you know, some videos that you've taken with regard to how, what you run into and sure. how you overcome this? Sure, be happy to do that. Let's see, there we go. All right, so uh, as Ro mentioned, uh, we're trying to solve uh, the crime of stress here and the butler didn't do it. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, you know, what we do in dentistry is stressful to begin with. And of course, you know, lately with COVID and uh, not being able to see patients for a long time and losing staff and losing patients and having big holes in your schedule, that only increases the stress. So what we do to try to um, alleviate some of that stress, especially, you know, from the financial end, is we try to bring more procedures into our practice. And of course, that causes some stress because if it's something you haven't done before, um, then definitely uh, that can add stress at the same time it solves another problem. And of course, um, with any new procedure you bring in, there's always the issue of complications and how to manage them. So what I want to talk about is basically in relation to oral surgery. If you're thinking of bringing oral surgical procedures into your practice, um, what are the things that you can do? What kind of mindset should you have in order to minimize the stress of doing surgical procedures? So first, first of all, I want you to remember that, you know, even though this, you know, you're not doing brain surgery or a kidney transplant or a bypass surgery, oral surgery is still surgery. You are cutting through bone, you're cutting through tissue, you're doing things that can hurt the patient and may be irreversible. And so you have to, you have to approach surgery with a lot of, a lot of respect. So first of all, I mean, should you even be doing surgery? That's the question I always ask um, doctors when they come to take my, my surgical courses. And the first question you should ask yourself is what's your experience? What's your comfort level? Did you do a GPR? Were you in the military? Um, or did you just take out you know, mobile periodontal involved teeth in dental school and that was it? Um, then jumping to typical average oral surgery in the office may be um, something that, that scares you. Um, are you willing to deal with the hassle factor? So when you're doing surgery, um, more so than if you're doing restorative dentistry, um, you are going to get calls at night and on weekends of patients who are in pain or are bleeding or have a problem or a question. And is this something you're willing to deal, deal with? Are you willing to go into your office at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night and see a patient who's bleeding? If you're doing surgical procedures, you want to make sure that you can perform them in a timely fashion. So it shouldn't take you any more than 30 minutes to take out one of the most, you know, the, probably the most difficult tooth you've ever seen. And if you're doing multiple, no more than 60, the patients can't stand being in the chair and being tortured for an hour trying to get a single tooth out. It's, it's a good way to have that patient leave your office and leave your practice and probably take their family members along with them. So you don't wanna do something that is going to um, diminish your practice. You wanna be able to deal with the complications that occur and complications will occur with surgery and we're gonna talk about those. And do you have backup? You need to have, if you're doing surgery, you need to have an oral surgeon who you have a mutually beneficial relationship with who is more than happy that if you have a problem you can't handle to take care of it for you and have your back. Um, if it's a one-way street, you're not going to have a lot of cooperation. And so um, that symbiotic relationship is really important. And finally, should things go wrong and you end up in court, Keep in mind that a GP doing a surgical procedure is held to the same standard of care 
as the specialist. And so if you don't have the proper training and experience and you have an adverse outcome, uh, you may as well just write the check. So how do we go about this? How do we um, go, how do we approach doing surgical uh, procedures in a, in a dental practice? Well, the first thing I want to want you to know or want you to kind of keep in mind is you've got to start thinking like a surgeon if you're doing surgery. And that means doing the same thing you do in general dentistry. If you're doing a crown prep, you have a mental image in your mind of what that prep is going to look like after you've taken your handpiece and instruments to it. You're going to know all the instruments that you're going to need for that procedure. You're going to know the instruments that you might need and have them handy. And if, uh, you know, let's say you're, the, the decay is close to the, to the pulp. You're going to be aware of that. You're going to know that there could be a pulp exposure. And what are you going to do if, you, uh, if that occurs? And so the same thing goes for surgery. You have to be able to do those same things, that same exercise, before you uh, embark on a surgical procedure. And um, you, especially, you know, with surgical complications, you have to know what they are and know how to handle them without even having to think about it. The other thing that I think is really helpful for surgery um, is headlight and loops. It really helps uh, to do surgery if you can see what you're doing. And I'm sure from your general dental uh, procedures, you, you know that. So what are some of the complications that you need to know about and have some uh, uh, plan for before you pick up that scalpel? Well, they're basically bleeding, a crown breaking off, which leaves you with root tips that could be ankylosed, displacing a tooth where it shouldn't be, uh, jaw fracture, communication between the sinus and the oral cavity, and injury to the mandibular and lingual nerves. So let's talk first about bleeding. And for the most part, controlling bleeding um, follows the rules that you learned or I learned as a Boy Scout, and that's put pressure on the wound. So we use gauze pressure to tampon on to stop uh, bleeding and then we may need to do other things if uh, once we get the bleeding controlled, we may use something like a gelatin sponge, which is dissolvable, or oxycellulose surgicel that we pack into the site um, is very helpful. Um, sutures. I hear from dentists all the time, oh, I put a suture to hold the blood clot. Well, suture does not hold the blood clot. Suture will hold the packing material in place, but by itself, a suture is not going to do anything. And if you've got bleeding from the soft tissue, then um, local anesthetic with epinephrine is really helpful uh, to uh, constrict the, the little arterioles and venules and, and uh, reduce the amount of bleeding. So let's look at a case where some bleeding occurred. I'm going to take out tooth number 17 on this young man. Um, he's uh, about 17 years old. And you can see we've got a mesioangular impaction at number 17. So I'm going to remove my bone to get access to it. I'm going to section the tooth so that um, I can take the tooth out in two halves. And I go to split the tooth and all of a sudden <laughs> it starts bleeding like crazy. So I already know what I'm going to do if this happens. And my staff already knows I'm going to get the tooth out as quickly as I can, see where the bleeding is coming from. And my staff is already going to have loaded up for me a two by two gauze uh, on, a, on a hemostat that I can pack like crazy into that socket and put as much pressure as I can. And I'm going to leave it there for about five or even 10 minutes until it looks like the bleeding has slowed down. Then I'm going to take the pack out, assess the where the bleeding is coming from again. And if it's still bleeding, I'm going to go ahead and pack it again. And I'm going to do the same thing, hold pressure on there for about five to 10 minutes. And hopefully that should slow it down significantly. You can see already the bleeding has slowed down. Then I'm going to take the gauze out. I'm going to take my gel foam and surgicel. And I actually like to um, roll the gelatin sponge in the surgicel. Um, I think it makes a nice little packing and make a little uh, pig in a blanket there. And I'm going to place that down where the bleeding is coming from. And then I'm going to pack on top of it again. And I'm going to leave that pack in place for about five minutes. And I'm going to come back if I have other teeth to extract. Um, since this was a third molar case, I'm going to do the other three. And I'm going to come back. And when the bleeding has stopped, then I know we're, we're done here. Um, we're going to tell the patient that they had bleeding just in case um, it occurs later. But we're going to go ahead and put our sutures, close everything up, and uh, move on to our next patient. What if a crown fractures off a tooth? Well, automatically, if you don't have a crown, then you're retrieving the roots. It becomes a surgical extraction. And so you have to know 
that if you have a surgical extraction, you need to have access. You need to lay a flap. You need to maybe remove some bone. You got to be able to see what you're doing and you have to make sure you have the right instruments. I can't tell you how many patients have been referred to me um, where they were in the dental chair for an hour taking out a tooth and the dentist only had a straight elevator an upper universal force up and a mouth mirror as their instruments. So you want to make sure you have the right instruments to do the job. And for broken roots, one of my favorite instruments to use is the X tool. And this is basically a cross between a uh, periotome and a thin elevator. And they come in different configurations. And you walk this down the periodontal ligament space. It, it severs the PDL. It also expands the alveolus at the same time. So here's a, a, a case that illustrates that. You can see we have tooth number uh, 20 here that's uh, fractured at the CEJ. We've got residual roots. It's a root canal tooth. And looking in cross section, we see that we've got good bone width and a low nerve. So I'm gonna actually do an immediate implant on this case. So I'm gonna do uh, all my planning uh, to remove the tooth, clean out the infection, and then place an immediate implant. So I'm gonna give just local infiltration with uh, mostly just articane. And I found find that um, for a premolar, this works really well uh, penetrates the bone well and gives me good anesthesia in 95% of the cases. So now I'm going to take my X tool. I'm going to work it down the PDL. I'm going to expand the alveolus and slowly mobilize the tooth. And you can see it's fractured right down the middle where the post was. Now that it's loose, I can take it, take it with my forceps and easily remove it. Whereas before, I think if I applied the force if it would have just crushed what was left. I'm going to thoroughly debride the extraction site with a double-ended curette. And you want to have that if you're doing surgery, because you got to remove the infected material. And then you're going to do lots of irrigation because the solution to pollution is dilution. That's something I learned in general surgery. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm going to replace my, my bite block and my airway isolation. And airway isolation is extremely important, whether you're doing extractions or implants, because Teeth can break, and you, the last thing you want to do is have the patient aspirate a piece of root or drop a, uh, um, a surgical instrument like a, a, a burr or a, an abutment down the patient's airway. That it kind of ruins the day. So we'll go through the motions. We do our first, second, and final, osteo final osteotomies, and then go ahead and place the implant. And you can see how this implant, uh, using a surgical guide, is placed in perfect position. And um, here it is in cross section on our CBCT about a month later. And you can see we've got perfect implant position when we do it with fully guided surgery. All right, so what are some other instruments that you should have if you're gonna have, be taking out teeth that are gonna break? A root tip elevator or a root tip pick is something that's used to get down deep into the socket. It's uh, skinnier than the X tool. And you notice how in this, in this diagram, how the tooth fractures or the root fractures obliquely. Well, that's the way it always happens. It never goes straight across. So you wanna put your root tip pick on the high side and then displace the tooth into the socket. Now, sometimes you can displace it part, like, part way, but you can't get it to come all the way out. And it's really hard to grab with a hemostat. So you wanna have on hand a root tip forceps. And this is the Stiglitz root tip forceps. It's my favorite. You can see how it's got very um, strong beaks and it, it goes down to a, a point um, that you could stab someone with and hurt them. And um, it's really nice for being able to grab small root tips that are deep within the socket. Another trick that I learned in residency was to take a number 50 or 60 endodontic file, screw it into the pulp chamber of the root and give it a little tug. And a lot of times it'll just pluck that thing right out. Now, sometimes you can use, you need to use physics as you see in this diagram, make sure that if that you have a little protection, some padding on that fulcrum so you don't break that tooth as you're trying to uh, leverage the root tip out. What about displacing teeth? That's another big concern uh, or another thing that you should be concerned about when you are um, doing extractions. So here is a root tip that was displaced into the maxillary sinus, okay? This is where diagnosis and planning is critical. If we take a look at this radiograph, we can see, and this was taken as soon as the patient was sent to my office. You see chronic sinusitis. You see the sinus full of fluid. You also see 
not very much bone here. And you can see where the root went through. This tells you or should tell you that this is a chronically infected tooth that has that has penetrated into the sinus. And if a root tip should break, it's probably going to go into the sinus. And if you debride the, all the granulation tissue out of the socket, you're probably going to end up in the sinus. So if you're not familiar with how to deal with oral antral communication, this is a case that you shouldn't even uh, attempt. Now, this is a, uh, an impacted third molar. Uh, it was a soft tissue impaction. The dentist went to go take out the tooth and made the error of not adequately exposing the area and having good visualization during surgery. And when she placed the elevator between uh, number one and number two to, dis to elevate number one out, it didn't go in the right direction. It went posteriorly and went into the pterygoid space. And of course, retrieving a tooth from this area is, uh, can be quite a challenge, as well as in this case, where the dentist displaced the tooth into the lingual side of the mandibular ramus. He failed to recognize it on the pre-op radiograph, on the pre-op panoramic that he took in his office, that the crown of tooth number 17 was pointed to the lingual and the roots to the buckle. So anyone can tell you, anyone with experience, that you've got to be really careful on what elevators you use and what instruments you use so that you don't displace this tooth into the wrong space. So again, planning. And you, you, know, you don't have to do every case. You've got to look at them and say, is this a case that um, I should be doing or is this a case I should be referring? You also need to know the anatomy of where you're doing your surgery to stay out of trouble. I had a dentist uh, probably a couple months ago who called me in a panic. Um, luckily, it wasn't Friday at 5 p.m., but it was uh, early in the week, earlier in the day, that he had a uh, patient that came in in pain, tooth number one with deep decay. He wanted to uh, went to go remove the tooth. He placed his elevator and broke off the crown. So rather than laying a flap and gaining exposure, he just kept working away with his straight elevator. And all of a sudden he froze. He thought he pushed the root tip into the maxillary sinus because he saw, and this, this quote, yellow stuff coming out of the extraction socket. So I said, send the patient right over. And when I take a look in the patient's mouth, I know exactly what this yellow stuff is. And if you're doing surgery in this area, you should know what this is. This is the buccal fat pad, which rests um, deep to the buccinator muscle. And you can see right here that if you violate um, the flap here, you push something up this or your elevator accidentally goes up here, you can expose the buccal fat pad. And, and surgeons who are used to doing high surgical impactions, high impactions of, of upper thirds are used to seeing the buccal fat pad. We call it big yellow. And when we see it, we know what to do. We know to pack it back into place um, and get it out of the way so we can complete the procedure. And then we will place something like gel foam or Surgicel into the site to hold it in place and then suture everything back in place. Now, if you can't get the whole fat pad, bad, fat, 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 fat pad back, um, you can excise a little bit of it and it won't cause a significant asymmetry. In fact, um, this is a procedure that's used by cosmetic surgeons to reduce that kind of uh, puffy cheek um, appearance. They, they do some resection of the buccal fat pad on purpose. What about a mandible fracture? You got to be really careful, especially in patients who are male, who are over 35 years old, if they've got a deeply impacted third molar, especially it was infected before surgery, and especially if they have impaired healing potential. You want to be careful, obviously, not to break the mandible while you're taking the tooth out, but actually most mandible fractures occur about one to three weeks after surgery as the bone is remodeling and the patient thinks it's okay to eat nuts or uh, something hard and they fracture the mandible. I had a patient that did this. Um, everything was great at, at one week. Everything was great at two weeks and actually one week and three weeks. And then later that day, he chomped on a toothpick and ended up with a pathological fracture. So if this occurs, if you see a fracture, a suspected fracture, you want to refer this patient immediately um, so it gets treated either by open or closed reduction, which is something a surgeon can determine. So here's a patient uh, who lives in Paris. She had, uh, as you can see, tooth number 17 was a deep impaction. It goes all the way down. Look at this, all the way down to the inferior border of the mandible, um, 
very intimately involved with the mandibular nerve. And the dentist took about uh, an hour or so to get this tooth out. Patient was visiting a friend of hers in LA from, from Paris. And this was about two and a half, three weeks after the procedure, she all of a sudden developed pain and swelling on, actually on the left side. And so um, she went to her friend's dentist and the friend took this panoramic, or the dentist took this panoramic radiograph. And as you can see, he correctly diagnosed a mandible fracture. So this fracture goes all the way through to the inferior border of the mandible. So this was treated by a closed reduction with, with arch bars and stabilized for about uh, six weeks. And then uh, the patient went back, went back to Paris. What about communication with the sinus, oral antral communication? It's most common with maxillary first molars, but it can also occur between the second premolar and the second molar. The best way to treat an OAF is by avoiding it. And again, this is by treatment planning, by diagnosing, by looking at your radiographs, looking at the patient clinically, like the one, like that root tip that went into the sinus. If you see a situation like this, where the sinus is dipping down along the roots as opposed to up here, there is a very good chance that when you take this tooth out, there's gonna be an oral antral communication when you have a pneumatized sinus like this. And especially if you've got divergent roots that you're gonna to have to section, um, this can um, really uh, present as a problem where you get an opening into the sinus. As far as treating it, that's, that's another lecture. Um, now, what about what are most common postoperatively? Well, the most common is a dry socket. We see it in about 10% of cases, uh, no matter how good an experience the surgeon is. Uh, infection, numbness, and fracture, those are kind of the big four. So what is a dry socket? I'm sure you remember this from dental school. It's not an infection. It's a localized alveolar osteitis where the blood clot is lost for who knows why. They think it might have something to do with a reaction against bacterial antigens that, that dissolves the clot, but no one is really sure. Higher incidence in smokers, higher incidence in, in uh, women who are on birth control pills. The treatment for this is pretty straightforward. It's irrigation, getting all the food debris and everything out of the socket, and then placing some kind of sedative paste that contains eugenol or oil of clove into the socket. Now, some people um, take some eugenol liquid and they put it in this bottle of packing gauze. And this is very effective. You pack the gauze um, into the socket and it prevents food from getting in. And also the eugenol uh, soothes the, the socket while it heals. The big thing you have to know about with this kind of stuff is you never leave this in the socket more than two days. You will, it will develop a nasty infection. And I've uh, been an expert witness on a few cases where this gauze was, was left in um, either because the, because the patient didn't return for follow-up or the dentist forgot to take it out, looked in the socket, said everything looked good. Um, and this can cause a, a heap of trouble. Now, a dry socket should get better almost by the time the patient gets to their car and definitely within one or two days, um, if it's treated, it should start getting a lot better. If it doesn't, then you've got to look for another cause of the patient's symptoms. Just remember when things don't seem right, there's a good chance that something's wrong. And the most common thing we see when a dry socket's not recurring is an, or not, not resolving is an infection. And just like a dry socket, we generally don't see infection until about the fourth or fifth or sixth day after surgery. But as opposed to a dry socket, the patient's going to have pain uh, or they're going to have pain. Generally with a dry socket, the pain radiates to the ear or the, or the jaw. But they're going to have pain, more of a dull pain. They're going to have facial swelling. They may have uh, inflammation at the side of the incision. Their skin may be red. They may have a, a sour or foul taste from discharge. They may have a low-grade fever. If this occurs then you got to treat it. And generally just putting the patients on antibi antibiotics um, like moxicillin, Keflex, clindamycin does the trick in addition to going in and irrigating out the site because it's usually food debris or a small sequestration of bone that sets up the infection. So you, you go in, you flush it out and put the patient on antibiotics, give them an irrigating syringe to flush out at home about four times a day. And that usually resolves the patient. You always want to see them 
um, a couple days after they present with a, an infection to make sure it's resolving. Um, if it doesn't get better after one or two days, I'll go back and I'll actually numb the socket and go in and thoroughly debride it out. And if there's, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, swelling in the soft tissues, I may need to place a drain. So here's a patient on post-op day six, came in the office. Um, I take out her four wisdom teeth. And as you can see, tooth number 17 in the socket, we see a little sequestrum of bone floating around and another little one here and maybe a little something here. This is generally from the interceptal bone that's between the roots. Um, becomes necrotic when you take the tooth out and, and the PDL and it'll float its way to the surface and form uh, essentially a foreign body reaction to the necrotic bone. And notice here, you see these little round circles. These are air pockets and they're pathognomonic of a bacterial infection because the bacteria release gases into the infected site. And so uh, with an infection in the soft tissue, you will see uh, gas pockets like that. What about injury of the mandibular nerve? Luckily, it's not too common. Um, we see it about a half a percent of the time. The patients will have transient numbness after, after surgery. Um, generally, it goes away in a couple of days as the swelling goes down. Sometimes it takes a couple of weeks, sometimes a couple of months to go away. Um, permanent numbness is only maybe one out of 20 to 25,000 patients. So uh, it's pretty rare. Now, how well they're going to do depends on whether they've got complete numbness and anesthesia versus pins and needles, a paresthesia. Generally, a paresthesia is going to have a much better prognosis than a complete anesthesia, which means the nerve was probably severely injured. Um, I call all my patients the evening of surgery and see how they're doing. And if they are still numb on that one site or even by, both bilaterally, um, I will start them immediately on a Medrol dose pack to reduce the inflammation, to reduce the pressure on that nerve to hopefully hasten recovery. If they have a dysesthesia, which is a burning pain, um, I will put them on gabapentin uh, in order to get them through the healing period. Is surgery indicated for, um, for mandibular numbness or for uh, V3 numbness? Only if there's an observed transection, if the patient is totally anesthetic or if they have a painful dysesthesia. And this is something obviously that you wanna refer the patient to an oral surgeon to evaluate and manage. And lastly, if you're doing implants, you need to be aware of peri-implantitis. And you know, there are about 3 million dental implants placed uh, every year in the U.S. And multiple studies have showed anywhere from 10 to 48 percent of these um, five, 10 years out will ex exhibit some form of peri-implant disease, which means uh, mucositis, which is like gingivitis, or peri-implantitis, which is like periodontitis. And it begins as just some inflammation to usually... Um, plaque or what we call the biofilm that accumulates on the implant if the patient does ha doesn't have good hygiene. Um, this then leads to some bleeding on probing. Um, and if this is allowed to go on, you get bone loss, you get probing depths greater than three millimeters. And then of course it, it remains hard to clean and it just progresses until the implant may lose um, you know, some, most, or even all of the bone. So the treatment for peri-implantitis to avoid this complication of implant loss is to jump on it as soon as you see it, see it beginning to happen. So this is a uh, patient who is the wife of a dentist. I didn't place this implant, but um, he knew that I, I do a lot of uh, peri-implantitis treatment in my practice. And notice there's just a very beginning of bone loss uh, around the threads, around the first thread of this implant that was placed about 10 years before. So the way that I treat these, uh, in addition to cur uh, curatage, is I use an erbium chromium YSSG laser, which is in the infrared spectrum, uh, 2780 nanometers for um, you laser nerds. And um, when, you know, this, this uh, laser, um, when we're treating uh, the, the pocket, we're treating the implant, puts out a lot of water spray. And so you need to be able to control the aerosol, control the water from going down the patient's throat. And so good airway isolation is important, uh, just like if you're doing a surgical extraction or anything in dentistry. So this tip debrides the, uh, the pocket around the implant. And then we can actually, uh, with this um, directional tip, 
uh, clean the implant itself and sterilize the implant surface, and then go back in again and do a final debridement in the in the uh, sock or in the pocket around the tooth. And this has been shown to uh, not only stop the progress of the peri implantitis, prevent further bone loss, but can actually um, stimulate uh, some bone regeneration. And if you look here, this may be a different angle, uh, but you can see how, remember the bone loss was to the first thread. It actually looks like we have some bony regeneration. And this was, uh, this is a radiograph one year post-treatment. I think she's now three years out and uh, everything is stable. So to end things, and by the way, this is a three hour lecture I condensed into about 15 minutes or 20, something like that. Um, what are the pitfalls you need to be aware of before you pick up that scalpel? Well, first of all, if you look at a patient comes in, they need a surgical extra or an extraction or anything surgical and you go, I've got time on my schedule. That's not a reason to do it. Okay. Just because you have the time doesn't mean you should do it. Never say it looks easy and use that as a rationalization to, to remove a tooth. We were told in residency, there are surgical extractions and there are non-surgical extractions. There's no such thing as an easy extraction. And if you want to call it easy, you don't call it easy until the tooth is on the tray. Okay. So never say it looks easy, not planning. So not looking at your radiographs, not looking at the patient clinically and seeing what you're getting into to avoid complications and knowing what you may have to manage. And again, not being prepared for those complications should they occur. And then, Again, not having the right instruments. The correct surgical instruments are so instrumental to being able to do good surgery. Just think about, you know, can you cut a steak with a butter knife? Sure you can, but it's going to be a lot of work and it's not going to be a very clean cut. Same thing in surgery. If you don't have the right instruments, the, the procedure is so much harder. Have a surgical plan. Look at the radiographs. Look at the patient. Walk through your uh, through the procedure in your head and know what you're getting yourself into. Know how to avoid the complications of the procedure that you're doing and know how to manage them if they occur without even having to think about it. If you look at a radiograph or look at the patient and say, you know, I think I can get that tooth out. Don't do it. You need to be able to say, I know I can do it based on your experience, based on your training, based on your comfort zone. Unless you can say, I know I can do it. Don't do it. So thank you for your time. Um, I appreciate um, you, uh, those of you who are still, still logged in listening to me and uh, those who are going to watch on uh, video. Let's see. Let me stop sharing my screen. And here we are back again. Um, so uh, how long did that take me? About 20 minutes? I tried to, well, I tried to talk fast. <laughs> well, first of all, because I knew our time limit. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking us through that. You know, the context of on the case is mm -hmm. to share with people, um, you know, this, these issues that they run into. And mm -hmm. there were so many pearls of wisdom that you had in there. And I really, really appreciate the, the context around that. Mm -hmm. First of all, I want to thank you because the amount of information there is, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. This is not intended to be a comprehensive uh, training session. No, it was not in, at all. Yeah, intended to highlight specific areas that people mm -hmm. And and professionals, clinicians run into, so that when they're when when they run into these, go and 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 find get the right things, do the planning. Doctor Jay Resnick is an oral and maxillofacial surgeon, and one of the one of the things that he has is a site called OnlineOralSurgery.com, where he gets into the details and into a lot more. Um, comprehensive explanation of all of the cases that he just uh, shared with us here. So yeah. um, for those of you who are watching, if you want more information about that, please take the time to go do that. In addition, you are a, you're a lecturing uh, doctor on mm -hmm. the online oral surgery site. Mm -hmm. that you're, you're going to be doing a, um, a live. You're doing a live implant surgery course for beginners. So uh, if you've only done, 
you know, half a dozen implants or, or fewer, or maybe, you know, only 10 in your career, and you want to learn the right way. We start with the very basics and we kind of build on that experience and, and uh, training. Uh, we start off with very basic cases because that's where you should start. And the nice thing about this course is we're going to have, it's a three day course. Um, and we're actually going to be doing surgery on live patients. So we have, we've teamed up with a, um, with a, a clinic that treats underserved patients. And so the patients we're going to be treating in the course are patients of this clinic who are really in need of, um, you know, tooth replacement and oral rehabilitation with dental implants. And so we're able to provide that service. And then the doctors at, um, the facility do all the screening for us and do the follow-up care. So it's a, it's a really nice arrangement and uh, we're limiting it to 12 doctors. Um, we only have a few spaces left and uh, this is going to be in August. And I can't remember the day, I think 14th to 6th, 17th or something like that. Um, it's on the website. And yeah. if you click on the upper left corner, you'll see a uh, live surgery course. And um, uh, I encourage you, to bring your surgical staff with you because if you go to a three day course and you do some implants and you're all excited and you go back to your office and tell your staff, let we're going to start doing implants. You can, you know, just guess what their reaction is going to be. But if you bring them to these courses and you they're engaged, they're involved, not only do you not have to teach them as much when you want to implement this in your practice, but they're excited to do implants because we actually let the assistants play some implants on models and they really love that. That is fantastic. Thank you for that. I also noticed that in uh, a bunch of your cases, you use the ice light, and it sounds mm -hmm. like from a from an operative as one of the instruments that you use as as part of that. And it, it, is yeah. it is it helpful for you? Oh yeah, very. Because you know we are taught in surgery, you got to protect the airway. You need to have a mouth prop uh, supporting the, the jaw because you're applying pressure to the mandible. Uh, you don't want the patient to bite you, and you have to have good visibility. And so if I have a patient where I'm doing a procedure under local anesthetic, um, I will use the isolate. It gives me a nice mouth prop. It gives me airway isolation. It's comfortable for the patients and it gives me good lighting um, in addition to my headlight and overhead light so I can see what I'm doing. And actually the, the end of it acts as a cheek retractor too. So it really helps uh, getting access to the area we're working. So I, I, yeah, I love, I love using the isolate for, uh, for procedures in the office. That is fantastic. So first of all, really appreciate your time. Um, if, if those of you who are watching, if you have any questions, please send them in. If you want to reach out to Dr. J Resnick, what would be the best, uh, best way uh, to go? The easiest email address is simply J, J A Y at online oral surgery.com. It's a, just one word online oral surgery.com. Oh, fantastic. And yeah. <clears throat> I know that there are probably a whole host of different, uh, questions you you dealt with them you know taking radiographs that mm -hmm. type of stuff mm -hmm. um, you already addressed profuse bleeding which is incredible yeah. um, if 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 I were to just ask one quick thing before we close down mm -hmm. here yeah what would the biggest question that you run into be um, and what advice would you give people watching oh gosh uh, there's so many good questions um, I, I think you know the biggest one people are concerned about is um, is bleeding. Cause that's, that's definitely the most dramatic and, and how to manage that. And, you know, sometimes you can anticipate it, uh, but most of the time you can't and just knowing what to do and training your staff exactly how to respond. Should you get a massive amount of bleeding um, will save the day. Uh, you don't want to panic. Okay. And there's a, there's a classic novel that uh, everyone who went through medical school read um, called House of God. And it's about this, this uh, intern uh, at a hospital in Boston and kind of a, it's a little, little bit embellished, um, uh, a little bit embellished uh, version of his, re of his internship. And there are some rules of the House of God. And one of them that's my favorite is the first thing you do at a code is to take your own pulse. Okay. <laughs> so what that means is just calm down, get a, um, get a overview of what's happening and then manage it. Don't panic. And of course, not panicking comes from experience and knowing what to do. So that's probably the most common question. <clears throat>
Awesome. And that, that and what instruments should I buy? <clears throat> there you go. And so I showed you, you some that I use that are go-tos in my office. Awesome. Well, yeah. first of all, thank you so mm -hmm. much for taking the time to do this. We really appreciate it. Those of you who if you like this content, please let you know. Uh, please let us know if you have questions. Please reach out to either Dr. Resnick or us. Mm -hmm. um, the Dental Voice on the Case is this, is this special series now, and what you'll be seeing going forward are different clinicians fighting dental crime. And today, it's how to basically reduce that stress and. The advice that you've given us is really wonderful. So really appreciate Great. it, Dr. Resnick. You're very Thank welcome. You it's so it's been a pleasure talking to you. And, Have and a great, you awesome. Have a great rest of your week. Uh, you too. We look forward to hearing you from you again. Sounds good. Can't wait. All right. All Take right. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.